good evening ladies and gentlemen friends and one and all who have joined us on behalf of national gallery of modern art bengaluru ministry of culture government of india i darshan kumar vayu deputy curator welcomes one and all for today's evening talk brought to you in collaboration with gandhi center for science and human values it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker for this evening professor sharada shrinivasan who is going to talk about india's heritage in sculpture to us professor sharada a padma shri awardee in archaeology is a professor at national institute of advanced studies pardon me and has a pioneering contribution in archaeology and history of art and architecture particularly from science scientific perspective professor sharada shrinivasan is a fellow of royal artistic society of great britain and world academy of art and science homi baba fellow and vna nehru trust fellow her awards include the dr kalpana chawla young women artistic uh, sorry scientific award indian institute of metal certificate of excellence material research society of india medal the melty b nagar ethno archaeology award dst serc young scientific fellowship forbes smithsonian institute research associate the flinders peter medal the material research society graduate student award the british achieving scholarship she has been a co recipient of research grant from ukri and ahrc uk sshrc canada royal society national science foundation and charles wells trust she is first author of the book india's legendary wood steel and contributing author to sc of classical art the bronze catalog of national museum delhi and co editor of digital hampi on digital exploration into the art and architecture of hampi she is on standing committee of international beginning of the use of metals and alloy conference has an accomplished exponent of classical dance from bharatnatyam she has given lecture performance such as on artistic and scientific aspects of chola nataraja bronze for winners including royal academy of arts london and santa barbara museum of art and with a novel contemporary classic internet streamed duet nataraja cosmos for space city tuluslos 2009 she earned her phd from the institute of institute of archaeology university college london 1996 on archaeometallurgy of south indian bronzes ma from school of oriental and african studies london 1989 and btech in engineering physics from iit bombay 1987 so it is with special excitement that i am pleased to welcome professor sharada srinivasan welcome ma'am so before i request the speaker to take over i uh, request uh, mr alan nazareth ambassador president for gandhi center for science and human values i welcome you sir i request uh, ambassador alan nazareth to please uh, start the program with a preamble or the introduction to the today's talk up to you sir yeah first of all i would like uh, to thank the national gallery of uh, modern art bangalore uh, for kindly collaborating with us in presenting this uh, what is going to be i'm sure a very outstanding and fascinating lecture Uh, i also extend a warm welcome to all those who are attending uh, this, uh, this event uh, what i would like to do is to make a brief recount of this whole series uh, of lectures on the on various aspects um, of uh, of the indian heritage on the one hand in science on the other hand in uh, in the arts uh, it all began in august of last year the lecture by the eminent astrophysicist dr jayant narlikar he spoke on why study astronomy this was followed just one week later on the 24th of august 2019 by a seminar on the same subject called the india's heritage in the field of astronomy it was presented by dr rodam nasima uh, r n ayengar and dr balachandra rao since um, the very eminent dr rodam nasima has just passed away i think yesterday was uh, his cremation 
I would like to maintain one minute of silence in his memory. He was a great support um, to me uh, when he was director of the of NIAS, uh, when I was as managing trustee of Saro, the International Trust, and even greater support after I took over as chairman of the Gandhi Center. So may I request all of you to maintain this one minute of silence in his, as a tribute to his memory. I thank you. Now, after this uh, seminar um, in, on India's heritage in the field of astronomy, the next lecture was by Dr. Rekha Rao. It was titled Religious Practices as Seen in the Indus Valley Seals. This was presented on October the 18th, 2019. This was followed by a very erudite lecture on India's heritage in the science and surgery fields by Dr. Shankaran Maliathan on November 22nd, 2019. After that, sadly, because of the COVID um, um, pandemic, we were unable to present um, any lectures because uh, there were restrictions also um, and difficulties in NGMA and we are, had our own difficulty. And the next lecture, therefore, could only take place one year later and that was given on November 13th, 2010, by Mr. Pralad Mahishi, a former Chief Secretary of um, the Karnataka government and also Secretary to Prime Minister. Um, uh, it was a very learned lecture on uh, Laurie Baker, the Gandhian architect. Like me, uh, Mr. Pralad Mahishi is a great um, admirer, fan of uh, uh, Laurie Baker. And uh, unlike me, he has the great advantage of living in a Laurie Baker designed home. Uh, so, and it was a fascinating lecture that he gave. He had a personal contact with him. He was able to show us uh, his drawings and his whole, uh, his whole thinking about using, uh, building uh, the finest buildings uh, with all locally available material and making maximum use of natural ventilation. Now, that was the last lecture, and now we have this very uh, amazing lecture. Um, all our uh, lecture, all the lecturers who have delivered uh, this series of lectures are very, very eminent person. But uh, this one seems very special because uh, she is so much respected. <laughs> um, it's amazing. Um, uh, I'd just like to read these few lines from her, uh, from her bio. Professor Sharada Srinivasan has earned her PhD from the Institute of Archaeology, University of London. So basically, she's an archaeologist um, on archaeometallurgy of South Indian bronzes from the School of Oriental and African Studies, London, and BTech in engineering physics from IIT Bombay. What a combination! She has also she has also been an accomplished exponent of the Bharatanatyam classical dance and has given numerous lecturers demonstrations such as on the artistic and scientific perspectives on the Chola Nataraja bronzes at the International Museum, such as the Royal Academy of Arts. Now, <laughs> I think it's an amazing uh, contribution. So um, we are uh, greatly uh, privileged uh, and deeply grateful to you, uh, Professor Shadal Srinivasan, for agreeing to give uh, this lecture. And I am greatly looking forward 
uh, to listening to you, as I'm sure there are very many others this evening. Thank you. Now the, now the stage is all yours. So, just a, I'll just take a minute. Uh, thank you, sir. I just want to like to welcome our director, uh, Ms. Nazneen Banu. She has joined us. Uh, Ma'am, uh, welcome you. And uh, we have uh, Mr. Nazareth and uh, uh, the Professor Shada Srinivasan with us. Thank you very much, Darshan. And, uh, 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 I'm really happy to be part of this uh, collaboration because we have, as uh, uh, Ambassador Nazareth has pointed out, we have done a lot of meaningful and interesting and educative lectures in collaboration with Gandhian Center for Science and Human Values in past. And uh, I personally look forward to listening to Professor uh, Sharda Srinivasan. She's also an IIT Mumbai graduate, so you missed that. She's an engineer as well. And so am I. So I have a special affinity. <laughs> so uh, most welcome, Professor uh, Sharda Srinivasan. And uh, over to you now. Com compared to you both, I'm the different. <laughs> Not at all, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Nazneen Banu and Darshan Shankar, for, for Darshan Kumar, for this wonderful opportunity to talk with the National Gallery of Modern Art. And uh, a, a very warm uh, thanks to Ambassador Alan Nazareth, who um, has been very dynamic in organizing the series along with you at the National Gallery of Modern Art through the Gandhi Center for Science and Human Values. And we've already had some very excellent lectures, as he has pointed out. And I'm also very uh, gratified to be part of this uh, family, um, looking at these very important aspects um, of uh, human values and so on. And some of the very eminent speakers that I feel very privileged to be at the company of, as he has pointed out, Professor Jayant Narlikar, uh, late Rodam Narsima, who was a director, a dynamic director of the National Institute in Advance, of Advanced Studies and uh, nurtured many of our activities also in heritage. And also the fascinating talk on Laurie Baker, because in a way, um, the uh, understanding of um, Gandhian science was also something which uh, also in a way um, uh, inspired me because uh, in my own family, uh, my uh, late uncle C.V. Seshadri used to talk a lot about uh, small is beautiful and uh, that kind of ethos of uh, um, appropriate technology, which also in a way induced me to get into the work of art and craft and every, and such like, but I was also inspired by uh, my father, who was um, a well-known um, atomic scientist and nuclear power uh, physicist, Dr. Ramas Srinivasan, to look at the scientific applications in art and archaeology. So it's wonderful to be able to have this opportunity to speak here at the National Gallery of Modern Art, because this is also, although we're talking about the heritage of uh, Indian sculpture, there are also so many contemporary resonances which are so important. It still informs our understanding in many ways, and not only in terms of aesthetics, but also performance, and uh, you know, also in terms of the technological prowess and so on. So it's wonderful to give this lecture here. So I will go on to share my screen now uh, without uh, further ado. Um, yes, so I think. Um, Um, just a minute. I'm just trying to let me just try that again. The share screen. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's coming up now. Do you see it now? Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Hello? Able to, yes, ma'am. Able to see your screen. Okay, wonderful. So, um, of course, when Ambassador Nazareth asked me to talk about uh, the heritage of Indian sculpture, uh, that is such a vast topic. 
um, you know, that it is impossible to do justice to uh, such a magnificent topic as it were. Um, but in a way, um, this task also um, uh, freed me maybe from having to obsess with too many of the uh, technical nuances in terms of the art historical detail and so on. So maybe because this being the National Gallery of Modern Art, uh, I've taken a slightly more experimental approach, perhaps a non-linear narrative. So uh, it doesn't really follow in strict chronological terms, but more in terms of either certain ideas or certain aspects which uh, tie, uh, you know, sculptural forms from different parts of uh, the country. And what is quite remarkable, of course, you'd be talking about a heritage here, which was uh, not only uh, of the Indian subcontinent, but also had a profound influence in various parts of Asia and so on. And even in contemporaneity, you're looking at a very uh, beautiful sculpture of the Chola Nataraja bronze of the 11th century, which uh, uh, often uh, sparks responses to it, describing it as the cosmic dance of Shiva, whether that is um, you know, absolutely relevant in terms of the original significance and so on is another matter of debate. But the fact that it evokes these responses in uh, the modern uh, world of uh, science and technology and contemporaneity um, points to the relevance of looking at sculpture from uh, different perspectives. Well, um, we in the Indian subcontinent, of course, has a very long legacy in terms of uh, civilizational heritage, going back to the Indus Valley or Harappan or uh, Sindhu Saraswati, or uh, as the labels may go, uh, going back to this um, a very uh, interesting and remarkable material culture, which was spread across uh, uh, the northwestern part of the subcontinent. And you're looking at the very spectacular dancing girl from Mohenjo-daro uh, in Pakistan, dated to about 2500 BCE. And what makes uh, this figure so contemporary and resonates even in modern times is at one level, it is not an elite depiction, but uh, perhaps an, an everyday kind of persona whom we can all relate to. And there are so many facets of continuity that we can see. For example, when I was uh, working at the Dholavira excavation in Gujarat, uh, you already see that the Rabari women are still wearing these shell bangles with their arm uh, right up to the shoulder. And uh, also, when you go to the Nilgiris, you see that the Kota women uh, the indigenous communities are still wearing their hair in a bun to one side, which resonates with the uh, Mohenjo-daro dancing girl, as do the Gons and uh, some other communities. And you also see that uh, posture of hers is also very contemporary. If you look at many of the 19th century prints of the hereditary Sadir dancers, they all stand in a very similar posture with the hand on the hip. And the crafts of this uh, great civilization also have many aspects of continuity. Although there is, of course, a hiatus in the sense that uh, there is a certain decline in the quantity and the quality of material culture in the subsequent eras. But at the same time, one can still discern some aspects of continuity. Um, the stone tradition that you see in Dholavira of worked stone is something which also resonates with the stalks and some also touching upon the stone culture. And you also see some of the figurines do re keep appearing in the later periods. For instance, there is uh, this beautiful elephant, solid cast elephant from Daimabad in Maharashtra of the late Harappan of about 1500 BCE. And in Kodumanal uh, of the third century from the megalithic, third century BC from the megalithic, you see this uh, fine tiger figurine, which is also inlaid with Kali, carnelian and lapis. Um, again, carnelian is something you also find a lot in the Indus tradition and so on. So it points to long distance exchanges with carnelian also being found in Mesopotamia and so on in the proto-historic and um, early uh, periods of uh, the Indian subcontinent's history. Well, there are aspects of recurring motifs or long-standing motifs, or even if you could just call it analogies, which keep occurring because in a way human thinking, uh, you know, uh, it, it, uh, humanity does think in different ways across different contexts. And it's quite remarkable when you look at this uh, steatite seal described as a proto-shiva from Mohenjo-daro, 
you can immediately see there are so many aspects which resonate even with uh, later traditions. For example, he's sitting very much um, in the cross-legged uh, posture, which is described could be described as a yogi kasana, which is also associated with ascetic traditions as um, as, as uh, uh, linked with uh, Vedic seers or rishis, for example, or even the um, Jain and Buddhist traditions which emerge in about the 6th and 5th century BC and so on, the ascetic posture and Padmasana and so on. And he he's also um, has a face with three heads. And that again resonates with the kind of iconography that you see associated with Brahmanical worship such as the Trimurti Shiva of the 6th century from Elephanta in Maharashtra, where um, in this case, the different aspects of the creator of Brahma, the preserver of Vishnu and the destroyer associated with Shiva are seen combined in this beautiful colossal sculpture. And at the same time, you also see there are links again with the uh, traditions such as of the uh, local communities such as the Gons of Central India, you see that they often have a headgear with horns or uh, three parts and so on, which resemble some of the headgears that are found in the uh, seal depictions. And one should also point out that the Gudimalam Lingam, which is made of limestone from the Shatavana period from Guntur in Andhra Pradesh in southeastern India, is in fact one of the earliest known full-fledged icons that one may associate with Hinduism. And this is of the second century BCE. And um, the Gons also in fact describe some of their deities as Lingo. So this idea that the Lingam worship could have had a long um, prevalence is also uh, something which uh, may point to these kinds of connectivities. And the wax model that you're looking at uh, at is by a Bastar Gon craftsperson, and that is also going to then be covered with numerous layers of clay, and the wax melted out and the metal poured in. So the lost wax casting process is what you um, also see in the Mohenjo-daro dancing girl, which also has a long continuing tradition. Well, as I was pointing out, in the subsequent periods, there is a hiatus in a way in terms of the finds of metal figurines. Uh, um, and uh, figurines as such, but there are a few um, interesting and excep exceptional examples. For instance, you have a mother goddess plaque from Adi Chinalur in Tamil Nadu, which is dated to about 800 BCE, and that also recalls a bit to the Harappan mother goddess. And you find similar plaques also emerging in the Mauryan period in the third century BCE from Northern India. And also in the second century from the Shatavahana period, you see a depiction of what we might describe as a yakshi. And you see that some of these uh, figurines also wear uh, rather prominent belts around the waist, which also recollects to what we call Odianam in Tamil maybe. And you also see from Mohenjo-daro this uh, repuse uh, fish motif belt, possibly, which was used as a waistband. And the Yakshi also uh, is a spirit or a tree nymph or a water nymph and uh, is, uh, is also celebrated a lot in the early art. And then you have the very spectacular life-size life Didar Ganj Yakshi, um, a tree spirit who's carrying a fly whisk, which is of about the first century, found near Patliputra um, of the Mauryan period. And it has... Um, this Mauryan style polish, well, it, it is now thought it might not quite be Mauryan, but perhaps more Kushan because of the Kushan style lock on the head. So there are these aspects in terms of the art history, but this is a very spectacular early example of monumental sculpture. Well, um, the monastic uh, faith of Buddhism, which emerged uh, around the fifth century BC or so, uh, was given a huge impetus under the Mauryan Emperor Ashoka, who took it to several corners of Asia. Uh, of Asia. And you're looking at the very spectacular Sanchi Stupa of the Mauryan period of about 3rd century BCE in central India, and the beautiful uh, sculpted Torana, and uh, Torana or the gateway. 
And it's interesting that the Buddha, however, is not depicted in the iconic form in early art. If you look more closely at the Torana, for example, you'll see a tree surrounded by elephants, or you see the Dharma Chakra and you see the Stupa, but there is no overt depiction of the Buddha in the human form at this period. And there are also Achaemenid influences that you can uh, detect, for instance, the uh, winged animals and so on, um, pointing to the connections also with the uh, Persian world. And interestingly, there is an interesting uh, uh, plaque which is said to be a portrait of uh, the Emperor Ashoka, which comes from North Karnataka in San Sanati or Kanganahalli, which is not far from Maurian rock edicts. And of course, this is of the Shatavahana period, uh, slightly later than the Maurian, which is about 2nd century BC to 2nd century CE. But it is a prominent depiction of the Maurian Emperor Ashoka. And there is also a distant analogy when you look at uh, um, artistic motives uh, in even later, when we talk about the railing and the umbrella that you see in the Sanchi Stupa, which is also sort, thought to relate to uh, the tree surrounded by railing as a way of embodying the Buddha. And you see also the beautiful tree of life motif, which is found in the 16th century Siddhi Said Mosque, which was assembled by a king of African Ethiopian origin. And in this case, the top of that tree uh, instead of the railing, you have a Kaaba. So, of course, it's a different context, uh, but you also can see how art tends to uh, produce very interesting and sometimes similar um, formulations. Well, the casting of metal icons still survives in the Tanjavur district in Tamil Nadu by what is described as the lost wax process or Madhu Chahista Vidhana in Sanskrit which is also mentioned in the Shilpa Shastras. And in this case, the image to be cast is first carved out of wax, as it were, and then encased in numerous layers of clay to form the mold. And then the mold is heated, so the wax is melted and expelled. And the molten metal is then heated and poured into the hollow mold. And when it solidifies and the mold is broken open, you get the cast image, which is then polished and finished to create the image. And you're also looking here at the metallic structure or the microstructure, which we study as archaeometallurgists and so on, of a 13th century Chola bronze. But it is also interesting that the metal casting itself had a beautiful um, metaphorical context as well, which is brought out by the 9th century Tamil woman saint, Andal, who sings, Ulle Ulle, which means that as a devotee of the Lord Vishnu, she prays for rain to fall on Vishnu in the same way that the wax which is molten inside the mold flows out of the mold. So there is this rather interesting aspect of connectivities. Well, some of the work that I had done, which I won't go into, but I would just like to foreground it because as I go through this talk, I will discuss some aspects of images, which I have what I would uh, describe as technically fingerprinted, which means I've tried to use the metal composition to help to better identify the issues of the date or the stylistic affiliation. And one of the techniques that I had used in this study, which goes back to my doctoral work, was uh, what we call lead isotope analysis, which also stems from the geochemistry of uranium and thorium. And there, as I say, I was also influenced perhaps by my father's work with uh, uranium and thorium geochemistry. And uh, basically what happens is that the different ore deposits have different ratios of the lead isotopes based on the geochemistry. And they tend to cluster together based on the similarity of the ore sources, which means that if we look at the lead isotope ratios of different artifacts which have had lead intentionally added in them, those which are from similar sources of lead would uh, tend to have the same isotopic ratios of the ore sources and also would tend to show some clustering. I won't go into this too much except to say that there are some interesting uh, examples of 
objects which we can trace the lead isotope ratios to the ore sources. In this case, we're looking at an interesting, very interesting image of Santi Natha, who is a Jain Tirthankara or spiritual teacher. And Jainism is another of the monastic faiths, which especially developed in Western India and also in Karnataka. And this is inscribed to the 12th century of the Solanki period. And it also had 24% zinc, zinc in it. It's a brass artifact. And it matched the lead isotope ratios for the Ambaji mine in Gujarat, which is uh, makes sense because of its uh, provenance as well. And also Western India, which has had a huge amount of ore deposits going up to the Aravallis in Rajasthan and so on, was also a crucible for a lot of metallurgy, early metallurgy. For instance, the early metallurgy of zinc was developed around the Zawar region, which has a lot of zinc cores. And it's interesting, though, that in this case, the zinc is not coming from Zawar, but from Ambaji uh, with 24% zinc. So perhaps there were other brass sources as well. And it's also interesting that in Western India, you have um, not only a great tradition of deep mining, but also the step wells, which is a very spectacular um, art form in itself, where uh, these wells were dug deep into uh, the earth with very beautiful embellishing on the sides and so on. And uh, they serve to also conserve water. And this is the Rani Kiva, which is a step well attributed to the 11th century Solanki queen. And uh, th this is also a World Heritage Site. And just to point out that part of the work that we do as archaeometallurgists is also to explore the old mining uh, sites. And you're looking at some traces of copper malachite mined out of uh, this old mine in Agni Gundala. And just to point out that this, there, there, to me, to my mind, the uh, skills of mining also is connected to the skills of setting up step wells and so on, which you see in various parts of India. Well, coming to the uh, bronzes, so there are certain bronzes which one has been able to identify using these technical fingerprinting methods that I was talking about. And one interesting case was an early historic bronze of this Yakshi with the goose, which is in the Victoria and Albert Museum. And one thing that we can do with the lead isotope analysis is to say, say where it may not have come from if there is no match with a particular ore source. Although we don't have the exhaustive lead isotope ratios of sources around India or elsewhere to make very conclusive attributions. But this, we could say that this is not actually from northern India because it didn't seem to fit any of the northern Indian mines. And one had also then looked at the chemical composition of the bronzes using uh, inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectroscopy and then try to group together the trace elements along with the lead isotope ratios and so that gave certain clustering and so this really seems to fit better a provenance of early historic South India and in many ways when you look at that attitude of the bronze you do see that kind of uh, sculptural form is prevalent in early historic South India. There's a very interesting um, a uh, greyware a fragment from Arikamedu of the first century, which is an Indo-Roman site which had extensive uh, trading with the Roman world, which is also mentioned in the accounts, Roman accounts of the Periplus and so on. And uh, in a way, the way it's shaped within that oval, it also recollects to um, the Roman signet rings. And there is also a gold signet ring from Karur of the first century, which shows a Mithuna couple which is in what we might call an Indo-Roman style. And the Shatavahanas of the Andhra uh, region in the second century BC to second century CE, also in the, uh, after about the first century, also began to have extensive Roman uh, contact and maritime contact also with Southeast Asia. And here you see a very beautiful depiction of Maya the mother of Buddha, which is related to the birth of the Buddha and uh, which takes place after the white elephant is encountered by her. And in those, um, she, uh, it, th those reliefs from Amravati, uh, the earlier one that you were looking at of Maya was from uh, the uh, Calcutta Museum. Next to it, you also see this rather interesting uh, depiction of a man playing a uh, what appears to be a lute, and he's holding it and strumming it almost as if a modern rock star would do. 
and uh, this is a very extraordinary, uh, perhaps one of the earliest depictions that one would find uh, uh, in any context of a lute, which is a precursor to various stringed musical instruments. And you can see here some of the other instruments which are also shown in sculpture. There's a beautiful uh, depiction of uh, a veena with three resonators from Sri Rangam in Tamil Nadu, which is of the late medieval period. And also in Tipu's palace in Sri Rangapatna of the 18th century, you see a depiction of a Tanpura, uh, which also looks a bit like the uh, lute that you're seeing in the Amravati sculpture. And veena making, of course, is a surviving tradition, for example, in Tanjavur. And I had also studied a Avalokiteshvara image from the Krishna Delta, which was fingerprinted to the Andhra Pallava period, which you can see here. And in this case, it is hollow cast in which uh, the uh, entire image is not made of solid metal, but there is a clay core on top of which the wax model is built so that it econ economizes the use of metal and there is just a thin layer of wax. And this is also a technique that was used a lot in the Hellenistic world and um, could well have had an impetus coming in from uh, uh, with all the Hellenistic contacts and so on. Another motif that we saw uh, in that greyware fragment from Arikamedu of the first century was that she's holding up something which looks like a mirror. And that is again a very timeless motif in Indian sculptural traditions. And uh, you see that in uh, across India, for instance, in Kajuraho in the 11th century and uh, Darpanika from Orissa of the 14th century. And also closer home, there's a very beautiful sculpture from uh, Belur of the Hoysala period in Karnataka of the 12th century, which was a site extensively patronized by Santala Devi, the celebrated dancer who became queen. And here she's depicted holding a mirror. And it's also found in Kerala. Well, the analysis that I, in, in Kerala, this is a beautiful wooden depiction actually uh, of uh, a lady holding a mirror. And you can see the resonance where the wood also is similar to the stone depictions. And in Kerala, there's a very spectacular craft of making uh, bronze mirrors with around 33% tin, which has this very specular, beautiful quality. And it's almost as if such a blank was used as a mirror in uh, these periods. Well, coming back to um, the early historic, one of the great sites of Buddhism also, apart from Sanchi, is Sarnath. And you're looking at the Dhamek Stupa in Sarnath, and this was again a site which um, uh, was active from about 3rd century BC to the 6th century. And the Gupta artistic idiom emerged at numerous centers such as Vidisha, Mathura and Sarnath by the 5th century. And you see here the seated Buddha at the bottom. And indeed that form of the seated Buddha uh, and in fact, Sarnath is a place where the first sermon of the Buddha is said to have been given in the deer park of Sarnath. And there's a beautiful image of the Sarnath Buddha seated in a Padmasana and with the Dharma Chakra Mudra of the Gupta era. And indeed, Buddhism was also prevalent in southern India quite early. Um, Kaveri Patinam is associated with a site which is described in Sangam Tamil literature of about uh, the early Christian era. And uh, Kaveri Patnam is also described as Puhar. And there's this rather lovely bronze figurine of a seated Buddha also from Puhar of about the third century. And here the robe is totally foldless, which is a very distinctive way of uh, uh, the, the Buddhist iconography of, uh, of this particular region. And you're also seeing a beautiful detail here from the Dhamek Stupa with some of the geese and the flowers uh, these kind of motifs you find also in uh, the early historic as well as in Ajanta and the painted motifs and rather fascinating geometric details on top of the, uh, the, the, the uh, upper courses. Well, um, another type of idiom of depicting the Buddha also emerged in the northwestern parts of India, which was really at the crossroads of the east and west with the Gandharan um, uh, material culture, where following the incursions of Alexander uh, in uh, 326 uh, BC, uh, there was a lot of influence from the Greco-Bactrian world, which also gave rise to a very distinctive type of sculptural tradition of the Buddha. And you're looking at a very beautiful gold reliquary 
in a stupa from Bimaran in Afghanistan of the first century, which is inset with garnets. And you can see pilasters here, which frame uh, the Buddha and the Bodhisattvas and Indra and Brahma and so on. And also a very beautiful Buddha head of stucco and polychrome, uh, which is in Afghanistan of four, fourth to fifth century, uh, now in the Victor and Albert Museum. And the same way of depicting pilasters, you also see in these Gandharan schist depictions. And there you see that the Buddha has distinctive um, detailing of the robe, which is also found in the colossal Bamiyan Buddha of the sixth century, which is about almost 55 meters, uh, though unfortunately that was destroyed uh, by the Taliban um, in, in, a, in a bout of uh, fundamentalist um, uh, destruction. And so this photograph is before uh, 2001. Well, another very interesting aspect of sculpture is what I would describe as monumental sculpture, which comes into vogue under the Pallavas in the 7th century in the Tamil region. And you're looking at a three-tiered roof of the Dravida style. And this is, in fact, one piece of sculpture where the rock, in this case, rather hard charnakite, has been sculpted top down. And it has captured or relicked this type of architectural style in wood, which is actually found across Asia in various places from Nepal to Japan, also in Sufi uh, mosques in Kashmir to Southwest India. And this remarkable seaport was also in maritime contact with um, the Far East and so on. And from here, the Pallava Grantha script, which was a script uh, which emerged to, to write Sanskrit uh, from the Tamil uh, script, which also traveled to Cambodia and, in, and influenced a lot of the East Asian writing styles as well. And here you also see, for example, this very remarkable sculpture of Narasimha Varman Pallava with a Grantha inscription. And you also see that there are resonances of influences in the Khmer region, for example. You have a Khmer Vishnu, which is a similar kind of monumental sculpture. And in some cases, you find that the, that the, that the conch of Vishnu is also connected to the head. And that is also something you find sometimes in uh, southern Indian sculpture, this kind of monumental sculpture, maybe because uh, to reinforce the image. And you're also looking at a bronze of uh, 7th century Vishnu. And you can see the radiograph which was done in collaboration with Ajikar. And that is a solid cast image, as you can see from the radiograph. And as I said, the South Indian region preferred to use the solid casting tradition, uh, whereas the hollow cast tradition was used much more in northern India. So talking about the sculpted monoliths, of course, we've talked about Mahabalipuram which also has some very spectacular sculptures in the caves, such as uh, this martial depiction of Kotravai or Durga uh, in Mamalapuram, uh, where she is riding a tiger. And what, some of the Rathas also have the depiction of the elephant and so on. And this, ex ex this experiment in rock art excavation is taken to a completely um, uh, a, a different order, a, a new zenith, with the uh, Rashtrakuta rock art excavations in Ellora of the 8th to 9th century, where basically, again, working top down, the basaltic trap, trap rock has been worked out into a whole, a wholly, uh, even more complex set of uh, shrines following the Dravida structure. And you also see here some um, resemblances. For instance, there is a sculpted Dhajasthamba. And by the time you come to the Chola period, this is the spectacular colossus of Rajaraja Chola, in, which was consecrated in 1010 CE, which is again made of Chanakite. And here it is what we call a full-fledged structural temple. And again, you see the Dvajasthamba or this, um, uh, this um, victory staff, as it were, which is found in the entrance to the temple. And uh, Coming back to the Buddha images, Nalanda had a great Mahavira and university which was visited, for example, by the Chinese traveler Huyn Sang. And it is from here that the spread of Buddhist teach, uh, teachings to East Asia uh, uh, really reached remote, remote corners in the seventh century. And Huyn Sang also traveled here in the time of King Harsha. Of course, from the Pallava region, we also have the myth of Bodhidharma, who traveled from Kanchipuram to East Asia. So it is 
through all of these travels and so on that Buddhism uh, spread far and wide. And you're looking at here at a image of a Buddha from Nalanda uh, and uh, a rather fine image of uh, Buddha uh, who had attained Nirvana or reached enlightenment as it were. And there is a very spectacular Holocaust life-size image of Buddha in the Birmingham Museum of the 6th to 7th century of the late Gupta period, which is the largest known uh, bronze image there is from the Indian subcontinent. And you can see here again uh, the beautiful robe. And it also rec recollects a bit to the Bamiyan Buddha and the way he stands and that colossal kind of stature. And the resonances are also seen, for example, in a Nagapatinam Buddha from Tamil Nadu. There's this beautiful gilt copper Buddha, which I had analyzed from the Victor and Albert Museum, which was fingerprinted to what I would describe as the uh, later Chola period. And here the robe is a bit similar to the Sultan Ganj Buddha. And here this, the, the image is mainly of copper because if it had too much lead, then it would make it more difficult to gild. So there are these various technicalities. And interestingly, this image also has holes, suggesting it was being taken around in procession like other South Indian um, bronze images. And you also see here the Pala influence in Eastern India. And the Pala style also travels a lot to um, the Himalayan region and Nepal and so on, as seen in this uh, gilt Buddha. And this is also the Mahayana school that emerges. And Rajaraja Choran, although he was a Shaivite, also patronized the setting up of a Buddhist Vihara at Nagapatinam by the Southeast Asian Sri Vijayan king from the region of the Malay archipelago. And there are numerous uh, bronzes of that uh, style as well at Nagapatinam. So I'll touch upon some of the masterpieces of Chola bronzes. And the Chola bronzes also draw a lot of attention due to their uh, wonderful naturalism. And it's interesting that there is a Chola inscription which mentions that the main deity or deva should be Ganamaga or solid. And the bull or the Rishabha can be Chaidya. So you're looking here at Shiva as Rishabha Vahana, which is a pastoral form of Shiva with the consort. And usually he's with the bull Nandi. So in this case, what the inscription is saying is that the bull can be a hollow cast, but the main image should be solid. And indeed, this image of Rishabhavahana Deva and consort from the Natanapurishwara temple in Tandantotam in Tanjavur district, which is attributed to Chola in the mid 10th century, you can see that the legs of the bull are all damaged because this was a hollow casting technique. And often in the hollow cast technique, the core gets damaged. And you're also looking at a stone version of Ardhanarishwara and the Nageshwara temple in Kumbhakonam, which is very beautiful. And it also is how these images are also often dressed. And here you see that it depicts Ardhanarishwara or Shiva and Parvati conjoined, which is also seen in a bronze version. And so typically in the stone, again, Ardhanarishwara is also with a bull. And as you see in the bronze version, this is the Chola piece of early 11th century, you can see actually the hand would have been holding a mirror, which is not there, the hand of Parvati. So it's a very beautiful blending together of the male and female attributes. Another interesting aspect is that though we've talked about the depictions of the deities, there are interesting aspects of intertwinings of deification as well and depictions of devotees. You're looking at a beautiful depiction in the Nageshwara temple in Kumbhakonam in the ninth century of this rather large uh, single piece sculpture of a Devi image standing again in this very beautiful kind of posture. And of course, we don't quite know who or what she represents. And next to her, we have a photograph of a Chola Devi with an attendant of bronze, which is fingerprinted to the 10th century. And again, she's standing with a hip with a flexion, which we term as the bhanga and the hand in the kapita gesture. So there are these resonances with the, um, uh, the dance related mudras and so on. And next to her, we have a very celebrated image of Tara, which is uh, found in Sri Lanka in Batikoloa which is in the British Museum. And this is again a gilt bronze image. And the interesting aspect from the lead isotope ratio studies that I had made was that this closely matches the Nagapatinam Buddha, which you saw earlier. 
So there is, it does bring to mind the ideas of whether there is a connection between these bronzes in terms of the source of metal and so on. And she was also found in Batikolawa or, or Eastern Sri Lanka, which had a lot of links also with the Tamil region. And she was found really off the seacoast. So it raises interesting points. And here too, she stands with the Bhanga or the Flexian, which is much more uh, rather strongly associated in a way with the Chola tradition. And next to her is a very beautiful image of a Devi in the Freer Gallery of Art. And now one should mention that according to inscription, the deified images of the 10th century Dowager Chola Queen Sembian Mahadevi were also taken out in procession. These Chola bronzes were also processional images and it appears that Sembian Mahadevi had also in a way attained such a status of deification that images of her were taken out in procession and there was a town named after her because she was a great patron of chola bronzes and and temples and the nataraja image also comes more prominently into vogue in in her uh the time of her patronage um and she was a widowed queen and this image has been attributed by some scholars such as the hegia to um being a portrait image of sembian mahadevi and here she's also shown with a uh, the, the sacred thread of learning showing that women were also ac accorded uh, a learned status. And next to this is a rather, uh, again, very imposing set of sculptures of Krishna Devaraya and wives in the Tirumala temple in, in Tirupati. And Krishna Devaraya, of course, needs no introduction to us here in Karnataka. He's a celebrated uh, early 16th century ruler of the Vijayanagara Empire in Karnataka, which extended uh, geographically to many parts of southern India and here he is uh, this is a portrait of him as a devotee with his two wives which he himself has installed so it's interesting that uh, again of the uh, this the, this tradition then of putting installing images of the donors of the devotees also in the temple and what is also interesting is the cap he's wearing which is not the crown that one is associating with some of the south indian bronzes or with the deities uh, which has more of a significance of divine uh, kingship but this is actually a kulai which is something you also find in the deccan painting and so on associated with uh, Persian or Muslim traders or even uh, Sufi dervishes and so on. So it's quite interesting that there are these signs of cosmopolitanism in these early periods as well and signs of exchange and maritime contact. Well, now I come to the spectacular Shiva Nataraja, which of course needs no introduction since so much has been written about this image. Uh, but it was really Ananda Kumaraswamy's stirring writings describing this image as poetry, but nonetheless science, which intrigued a lot of philosophers and scientists and artists across the world. And the analysis that I had done of this particular image showed that it was of bronze of 8% tin and 8% lead. And as Kumaraswamy described it, uh, this image depicts the Panchakritya or the five actions of Shiva where he balances creation or srishti as depicted with a drum with the fire of destruction or samhara and the prabhavali depicts this eternal cycles of cosmic creation and destruction and he dances at, on top of the demon apasmara and it's also interesting that this depiction is also described as ananda tandava or the dance of furious bliss in a way, again, bringing together these opposing elements. And I think that is the beauty of the Chola bronzes, always bringing together opposing elements, whether it was the male and the female and the Ardhanarishwara, and here the creative and the destructive and so on. But to just look at some of the antecedents and so on and the precedents, the um, Chalukya Badami uh, uh, cave has a very beautiful depiction of Shiva as Natesha, dancing with numerous arms, a very powerful depiction of the 6th century. But here he is dancing in the Chatura Tandava posture and there is also a drummer by his side and so on and uh, uh, Ganesha as well. But the depiction that we associate with Shiva Nataraja of Bhujanga Trasita Karana, which is the leg extended in this particular uh, manner with um, uh, which is described as a Bhujanga Trasita Karana, that is something which already seems to have come into vogue in the Pallava period. Uh, for instance, at the bottom, you're looking at a Pallava bronze 
which I had fingerprinted and found that it actually fits attributions of the Pallava period. And in this fingerprinting, one had also used dated seals and other artifacts. And it's also interesting that in a collaboration that I had undertaken with the late astrophysicist, Dr. Nirupama Raghavan, we had plotted the star chart of the Orion constellation of uh, 800 CE. And that also falls along the body and the, the belt falls along the waist of the Nataraja. And the star Arudra or Betelgeuse falls on the shoulder of the Shiva Nataraja. And in fact, there is a tradition in the Chidambaram temple, which is dedicated to the worship of Shiva Nataraja, both in the anthropomorphic dancing form, as well as the formless Akasha or Ether. And there is a tradition in this particular time, in fact, Margari Tiruvadurai, uh, in fact, in, in the next few days itself, where you see the Orion constellation in, in the zenith in the uh, Chidambaram temple. And that is described as the Arudra Tandava Darshanam, or the uh, the, the sighting of the dance of Shiva in the form of Arudra, which is related to Orion or Betelgeuse. And of course, as processional icons and icons in worship, the way you see them in temples would be as, as you're seeing it in the Brahadishwara temple with all the cladding and the silk and the jewelries and the garlanding and so on. And uh, um, uh, also to point out that the Chidambaram temple also has very beautiful depictions of the dancers themselves, the 108 Karanas, and the numerous postures of the dancers, which goes back to the 12th century. I'll also touch upon uh, the aspect of the feminine with respect to knowledge and learning, because there is also a very beautiful depiction of Saraswati, the goddess of learning in the Brihadishwara temple, attributed to about 1000 CE. And she's sitting here cross-legged and she also has the sacred thread associated with uh, more typically with male Brahmanic learning. But here often in Chola deities and Chola depictions, the women also have uh, the sacred thread. And it's also interesting that behind her is a depiction of a Prabhavali, which is very close to what you find in the metal form. So there is this very interesting interplay between the metal and the, the stone forms. And next to her is a really breathtaking description a depiction from the Kalyana Chalukya period from Karnataka of the 11th century in from Jalasangui, which is of a lady who is a scribe. And you can see that she is also using Hale Kannada or Old Kannada. And this is in the eulogy of the king. And this is really such a spectacular depiction showing that women also had access to learning and uh, the arts and so on, to esoteric learning and so on. And next to that is a bronze image of uh, a Jain deity, Ambika, who is also associated with learning, also from Karnataka. This is now in the British Museum. And again, you see that Prabhavali, which is echoed also in the Saraswati form. And this is also an inscribed image. And there she holds not just the lotus, but also she holds palm leaf manuscripts in one hand. So uh, this strong correlation with learning there. And next to her is a rather fine image in silver from Sri Lanka of Tara, the Buddhist deity, who is also associated with aspects of esoteric knowledge and so on. And there she sits exactly as the Saraswati uh, in the Brihadishra temple in the cross-legged posture. Well, coming to asceticism and the elements, one must make a mention of the colossal Jaina image of Gomateshwara or Bahubali in Karnataka, which is one of the largest monolithic sculptures at about 17 meters in Shravanabelagola. And Shravanabelagola also has an ancient history of Jainism with the Chandragupta Maurya having uh, said to have gone there to that hill, retired to that hill. And this image is of the Ganga period of the 10th century. And we had tried to make some drone studies with the late Professor Shetta, who was also a great art historian, who's written a lot on Jainism, whom we also lost, sadly, in the beginning of this year. And um, there is a lovely bronze of Gomateshwara or Bahubali, as he's also known, who is in deep meditation and the plants and so on have grown all over him. And it's a similar depiction that you find in bronze to the stone version, which is also seen in the uh, CSVMS Museum. 
And there is also a find of a Jain image from Tamil Nadu, which I had fingerprinted to uh, the late Pandian, later Pandian period, as I call it, around the 13th century or so, where, again, the image is standing in what we call as Kaya to Sarga or this very erect posture. Another very interesting site was excavated uh, not far from Bangalore called Aritipura. And there are rock shelters there and giant sites and uh, remnants of the brick temples and a beautiful image of Parshvanatha, where uh, this is an, a, a Tirthankara who is surrounded here by serpents and the, he's set within the hooded serpents. And that image also reminded me in terms of just the form and so on of the spectacular sculpture again in Badami of the sixth century of the Chalukya period, of course, much earlier, where there's a beautiful image of Vishnu, the preserver on Adi Shesha or the serpent. And you can see how the serpent is almost like a cushion over there, um, you know, the coils of the serpent. And you also see that there are syncretic influences because although he holds the uh, attributes of Vishnu, the conch and the discus, the way he sits with the um, uh, with the coil and the naga hood on him it reminds a lot of Hindu, I'm sorry, of Jain and Buddhist bronzes also, where the Buddha also sits uh, within the naga and so, and this is of course a Hindu image, but there are all these kinds of aspects of give and take, uh, you know, and perhaps also the sculptors worked for different, the, the sculptors in different guilds works for patrons of different religions and so on. Well, another rather delectable uh, point that I'd like to make is the connections between the Tamil country and Cambodia. Of course, we know that the greater Sanskritic tradition and the epics and the Ramayana and Bharat, Mahabharat and so on traveled a lot to Southeast Asia. But what is really also most intriguing is that uh, Karaikal Amayar, who is a sixth century Tamil woman poet saint, uh, who's found only, her depictions are only found in Tamil Nadu, and she's said to have hailed from a merchant family in the coastal port town of Karaikal. And she is, of course, depicted in um, many of the uh, Chola images of Shiva Nataraja, although she's said to have lived in the 6th century. For instance, there is a 10th century uh, Chola remnants in the Tirunageshwaram temple, which shows Karaikalamayar playing the symbols next to the dancing Shivanataraja. And she prayed to be turned from a beautiful woman into a hag so that she could accompany Shivanataraja in the cremation grounds and so on. So in a way, it is a rather subversive idea of wanting to move away from visual beauty and uh, you know the fact that any kind of form can celebrate and be celebrated and aspire for the divine so there is there is a, a lot of resonance there and that is also what the bhakti tradition of worship was about that you did not need organized religion or um, a hierarchical religion really but that your access to, uh, to 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 the divine or to access to transcendent could be accessible to anybody regardless of the form or the strata of society and the socioeconomic condition. And, and that is why you also find that, you know, she, she's depicted as a girl dancing in the cremation grounds and so on. And there you see her in this rather beautiful uh, sculptural de depiction from Vyanta Shri. And uh, she is playing the symbols next to the dancing Shiva Nataraja. Of course, here he's following the Natesha pose uh, with several hands, reminiscent perhaps more of the Badami kind of sculpture. And she's holding these symbols. And you also see that there is a lovely uh, depiction in a temple of the Semyan Mahadevi period from Tiruvelangadu in the 10th century, where she's Karaikalamayar is playing the symbols. And the feet coming together, you know, it also reminds you again of that yogi kasana going back to even the, the Harappan period. And I was also able to analyze a bronze image, which is in the Victoria and Albert Museum, which also fitted the technical fingerprints for the later Pandian period. And it had about 20% lead and 3% tin. And intriguingly, she's also shown having fangs over here, which I think also uh, connects to the uh, Cambodian tradition. So there are these interesting resonances. So this is my last but one slide. Um, I'll touch upon the incarnations of Vishnu. And as I said, as I'm going back and forth in time, you have the beautiful uh, Gupta era depiction in Udaygiri of the Boar incarnation of Vishnu. 
uh, where, uh, uh, where Vishnu as Varaha is upholding Bhudevi and he saves the earth. And this is, I think, a very beautiful contemporary metaphor in a way, the earth being saved by, uh, you know, of course, we human things, we are the we humans think we are the only ones who uh, own the earth, but, you know, it belongs to the animal world, the flora and the faunal world as well. And here it is the faunal world, the boar uh, incarnation, which is holding up and saving uh, the, the earth. And this is also a depiction you find in the Pallava context in the seventh century. But here, um, in as as we keep going uh, for you know in, in later in time and further south as well, the uh, female deity becomes bigger and bigger. <laughs> the female becomes more prominent, I think, in general in in southern India, which is I think uh, something we find even to this day. And here you find that the Budevi has become uh, larger in the Pallava period and even larger in the Vijayanagara period. And she's seated on Varaha, almost on par with him in terms of the scale. And that image of uh, Varaha in bronze with Bhudevi is uh, also fingerprinted by me to the Vijayanagara period of bronze. But it's also interesting that there is a very spectacular image uh, from Kashmir, the Vaikuntha Chaturmurti Vishnu of the 9th century in the National Museum. And this is a very spectacular bronze of the Kashmir uh, school, which is also another great school of Brahmanical uh, and Hindu bronzes. And here you see that this four-headed Vishnu includes uh, two of the avatars, there is the uh, lion avatar um, as Narasimha, as well as the boar avatar and, and Varaha. So all of these heads comprise that. And in the Vijayanagara period also, there is a great celebration of the Narasimha avatar of Vishnu as the man lion, uh, the ferocious man lion who destroyed the evil Asura Hiranya Kashapu and so on. And here, the colossus that you see um, was also a uh, um, built by Krishna Devaraya, where it is a standalone temple, where Narasimha is seated on top of a, a serpent. And originally, this image had a beautiful image of Lakshmi, but during the sack of uh, uh, Vijayanagara by the Deccan, uh, the Confederation of Deccan Muslim Sultanates in 1565, uh, this image was vandalized and Lakshmi was detached. And then it was later restored. Um, but it's also interesting here, you can see the possibilities of technology and modern digital uh, reconstruction using the uh, laser scanning and the generation of point clouds and so on, which give a rather good detailing of the image. And you can see the, the hand of the Lakshmi, which is all that's left uh, going around uh, Vishnu. And I had also done an analysis of one particular image of uh, Rama from the Victoria and Albert Museum. It's a very imposing and beautiful image of Rama holding a bow. And it's in the Vijayanagara period that a very prominent temple to Rama comes into uh, being the Ramachandra temple. And this image was also a brass image with 21% zinc. And uh, so there is a shift to using more brass in later periods, whereas the earlier periods had a lot more use of, of bronze. And to also point out that apart from metallurgical analysis, the analysis of the stone also can give us various insights into the way um, artifacts are made and the provenance. And this is a petrography of the porphyritic granite from Humpy that you're looking at uh, below, a polarized uh, microscope uh, thin section. Well, there is also contemporary inspiration from the ethos and sculpture and aesthetics uh, of uh, ancient sculpture and the allied arts, even into the present day. And as I mentioned, Andal earlier in this month of Margari, Andal is also celebrated and many dancers also pay their respects through compositions of Andal. And there's a lovely uh, photograph that I was given by the Bharatanatyam dancer Zakir Hussain as Andal from Tamil Nadu. And also the parrot is depicted here. And uh, I, I myself have been rather inspired by these sculptures in my journey. And there is a, the, the beautiful aspect is that although these sculptures and bronzes and so on are very intensely visualized, there is also this transcendental dimension, which is very beautifully captured in a verse by Manika Vachakar, where he sings, Adiyam antama milladavar, mundiya mudal, nadu iridiyo manai. The one who is without beginning and the end, the one who is the top, the bottom and the middle. So this idea of, of abstraction, of transcendence, of connect, connecting the human and the divine 
the, the inner space and the outer space and through the mechanism of dance, because Manika Vachikar himself as a Shaiva Siddhanta devotee also talks about how uh, Shiva enters his aham and causes him to dance. His aham is the inner self, the term, same term that you find used in Sangam poetry. So the sense of the dance is what inspires and elevates and transforms as any other uh, cr creative and artistic activity which enriches us connecting, I think, the arts and the sciences. So all of this is a very profound and moving experience for me as well, apart from the research aspects. And finally, I will uh, also just point to, I mean, the innumerable people to be acknowledged in some of my research publications, but many thanks to all the museums and the many collaborators and scholars who have uh, supported me in my journey and to who have help me with the photographs and so on of artifacts. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. It was a very uh, enlightening and uh, very interesting talk. I would uh, like uh, the Nazmin Banu director of India to you know uh, conclude uh, with a uh, thanks and i also like to check with uh, mr alan as richard do you have anything uh, to you know uh, to note or to, to you know make a point at this point of time yes i would like to uh, congratulate and thank professor sharada srinivasan she has absolutely taken my breath away with uh, with, uh, with all that she has told us, uh, it's really so erudite, it's so broad spectrum. She has covered so much in just, uh, just an hour. You are really truly outstanding, Professor Shantra God bless you and, and, uh, and may, may he take you to many more places and to greater heights. But you have really taken my breath away. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, I also want to say that uh, we would very much like uh, the text of your talk because we want to bring this out as a public, as one of our publications. You know, we are also a publishing house, and we would like very much to, to bring this either as a separate book or as a part of uh, a compendium of the Indian heritage and the arts. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your very kind words. Uh, coming from you, that really means a lot with the great erudition and uh, the sensibilities. Thank you so much, sir. That would be a privilege also to contribute to the whole. Darshan, do you do we have any questions from the participants? And do we have any questions from the participants? Yeah, if we have any questions, we can uh, take. I think now we'll open uh, the form for uh, uh, you know question and answers. As of now, we haven't uh, received anything as such uh, uh, any questions uh, to the speaker as of now. But uh, we will take uh, a minute or so. For if anybody has to make any questions, request uh, to the speaker, they can put it in the comments so that we can now uh, request the speaker to respond to the question of the others. So we have one uh, by Mr. Ganesh Swami. He says, uh, thank you for a fine use of narrative. What are the scientific uh, methods of accurately cataloging old bronze in a manner the information can be used to definitively distinguish them from later idols? Yeah, so... Um So as, as I pointed out, some of uh, because a lot of these uh, images, at least in the South Indian context, are solid cast. So you can't, if, if they had a clay core, it depends on how they are made. If they have a clay core, you can try to even use um, other ways of authenticating, like the thermal luminescence analysis and so on. But at the moment, I think that this uh, uh, profiling we have managed to do with lead isotope analysis and face element analysis is. Uh, proven to be quite interesting. The point is that with all of this, um, you know, there isn't any one size fits all. If you need to first study a representative sample of, of uh, material from a particular context, in this case, a lot of my material work has been on the Tamil Nadu uh, bronzes and so on. So I've been able to make some um, 
uh, in, uh, you know, conclusions because there was a statistically significant number of images of that period uh, that were studied. But if you, for, for instance, want to extend this to Karnataka, then one needs to first analyze enough of, um, you know, artifacts in Karnataka. And I think they're also looking at the copper plates could be quite interesting because those also have certain signatures and so on. So uh, it, it, these kinds of studies, they do involve a lot of, um, you know, expertise in terms of laboratories, which, uh, you know, they, because, for instance, even thermal analyzation, mass spectroscopy, it's a very... Um, uh, an advanced technique at these ultra high clean labs and so on. So quite often, you know, you do end up going need to end up to go to the best labs, uh, whether they're abroad and so on. So it's, it's not that trivial, but these things can be done, and you know, with the right access and to information resources, it could be. And of course, if they're also a holocaust, you can use radiography and so on. So there are ways of um, doing all of this and the metallurgical analysis. The main thing is people have to be willing to allow, uh, you know, the studies to take place. And of course, now there are very sophisticated techniques of micro sampling and so on. Yeah. Where can one learn the basics of creating these statues and sculptures? Um, well, there, there um, I guess, in a way, you know, the idea of granting um, Geographic locations to some of these crafts. And since the Swami Malay Brown's casting has also been accorded a geographic location. Uh, on the one hand, that is also a means to protect perhaps the knowledge uh, system of the civility and heritage craft people and so on, so that it, so that it can at least survive, uh, you know, in their hands, uh, you know, without, uh, you know, in this case, patenting. Because, for instance, you could even have just like it's happening with silk. I mean, the Chinese are making kanjiwaram silk and so on. So, you know, so could uh, that could happen also with, with bronzes and so on. And there have been, of course, uh, even in Tamil Nadu, there have been other uh, training centers and so on, the regional uh, training centers for handicrafts at Pumpuhar, and that's also been there in Karnataka and so on. Uh, but uh, th those have been mainly at a vocational level for those who are seriously about wanting to pursue, let's say, a career to set up a padre and start making icons for uh, for that particular kind of clientele. I don't know how much of it has actually been absorbed, let's say, into uh, more um, though, of course, I'm sure the modern art schools also have their components of teaching aspects of traditional sculpture and so on. But there is, I think, a lot more integration that could happen in terms of education and pedagogy and getting the craftspeople involved and so on and learning on this. Yeah, is the lost wax method? Um, no, uh, it's not unique in the sense that you've, you've, uh, we've already talked about it having quite an antiquity in the, in, in the, uh, you know, going back to uh, the Harappan period in the Indian subcontinent. But the lost wax casting was also known uh, in, in the Middle East. In, in fact, it is in, in Israel, in Timna, in the Timna Valley that it's thought to have really developed. Uh, going back even to about um, 5000 BC or so, you see lost wax cast, uh, uh, cast artifacts and so on. So it, it, it does have quite a long history going back to the Levant and then spreading to other parts of the Near East and Middle East and so on. But sometimes these techniques could also re-emerge. You know, nowadays people don't look at the old fashioned diffusion theory where there's only one source and then technologies diffuse out. They, they can emerge at different points of time in different places and so on. I think uh, there are uh, no any more uh, qu you know, questions to you, ma'am. So I request uh, uh, hand over to the director to you know, uh, make a note of thanks. Well, uh, thank you very much, Darshan. And uh, let me uh, first begin by thanking the star speaker of the day, uh, Sharada Srinivasan for uh, presenting a very well researched and in-depth and comprehensive coverage of India's rich and uh, incredibly diverse cultural uh, heritage in, in the field of uh, sculpture. It was uh, indeed a very, very educative and uh, informative presentation. So thank you very much from the bottom of our heart for sparing your time and for agreeing to deliver this lecture. And uh, we look forward to more collaborations with you and uh, our 
Thank you. Thanks to Ambassador Ellen Nazirat, Chairman Gandhian Center for Science and Human Values, for initiating this collaborative presentation at the National Gallery of Modern Art, Bangalore, and also for uh, his continued collaboration with us and presenting many, many interesting and educative lectures by erudite speakers and uh, covering diverse topics uh, concerning the interest of public at large, which we continue to get very encouraging feedback from our audience. And uh, NGMA looks forward to this collaborative effort with the Gandhian Center of Science and New Human Values in the years to come. So thank you very much, sir. And uh, thanks to the curatorial team of NGMA, and especially to Darshan, for uh, the deputy curator of NGMA, for designing the magnificent e-invite, which he always does, and also for coordinating and putting the show uh, together. And uh, thanks to all the participants for uh, joining us this evening. And we look forward to your comments, suggestions, and feedbacks. Uh, which would help us in uh, improving and uh, our presentations and uh, lectures in future. So thank you very much uh, once again, and a special thanks to you, Professor Shah Darshan Thank you. Thank you so much. Over to you, Darshan. Thank you so much, Nazneen. That was a great uh, privilege, and we look forward to collaborating further also with you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the, thanks to the speaker for today. And we have received many uh, wonderful and very encouraging comments for us to organize such talks, as well as a lot of encouragement uh, and also compliments for the speaker for presenting a very insightful and amazing presentation. Uh, so, ma'am, you can check out the comments. Before we conclude, I have an announcement to National Gallery of Modern Art in Bengaluru. Ministry of Culture, Government of uh, India, in collaboration with Ananya Drishya, invites uh, all of you for to attend a virtual panel discussion titled "The Road Less Traveled: Drawing Then and Now." It's on uh, Tuesday, 22nd December, at 4 p.m., which will be live streamed on Facebook as this presentation is done. The presentation will be done by Dr. Ashrafi Bhagat, a known art historian from Madras and uh, moderated by Ravi Kumar Kashi, artist from Karnataka. We have panelists uh, Shantamani Mudaya, V. Ramesh, R.M. Palaniyappan, the artist. Uh, so, you know, it is requested, uh, you know, for a convenient and uh, easy access with the notification. Please follow the MGMA page. So, you know, you will get a notification and it would be very easy to log in. And we understand and uh, there are certain constraints when we do online, uh, you know, events as such. So, you know, to access or to see it live, one has to have a Facebook account uh, to, you know, view the online uh, event which is going on. I request, uh, you know, people could access, uh, you know, from anybody other's account to look at uh, the event which is going on. Of course, the presentation will be showcased, uh, you know, recorded, will be, you know, within a few minutes, it will be on on the page. So, you know, people who have missed out, you can please check it out. So thank you all and uh, have a wonderful evening. Uh, again, thanks to the speaker and uh, thanks to Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Alan Ezra, and thanks to our director, uh, Ms. Nazmi Banu. Thank you all. Thank you thank and you. thank you, thank Captain. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, thank you, you have a lovely smile. Keep smiling. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You, you too, but not mean you smile too. Beautiful smile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you too, sir. Your smile matters a lot to all of us. Mine is an old, mine is an old man's smile. <laughs> yeah, old is gold. <laughs> yeah. Like mine. Like. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, thank you. And happy new year in advance to all of you. Have a great holiday season. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to be done now. Well, I look forward when COVID is removed and 
it can be done in a more big screen. I still haven't gone offline. Will you have a cup of tea? No tea. Not in a basic bed. This is done. They, they, they put everyone off. I'm still on there. No, no, that's okay. You're supposed to leave on your own. I'll close it. Okay.